Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Kinley Williams. I am the co-chair of the Legislative Committee of the Statewide Independent Living Council here in Maryland. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a white female. I want to welcome all of you to our Raising Our Voices, How to Effectively Advocate for Disability Issues at the Maryland General Assembly training. This training is for the Independent Living Network here in Maryland. So whether you are a member of the Statewide Independent Living Council, whether you are a staff member at a Center for Independent Living, a director at a SIL, uh, a volunteer for the Independent Living Network, uh, a consumer at an, at an IL Center, whatever your role is in the independent living community, today's presentation is going to be relevant to you because we will be talking about advocacy in the Maryland General Assembly and how individuals with disabilities can raise our voices for the issues that are important to us. Um, this, this presentation is unique in that there will be aspects of it that a lot of you who have been doing this for a while may already know, but we do feel that you will still get something out of it, whether this is new to you or whether you've been doing this for a while. So we welcome all of you from all different experience levels. This presentation, we are primarily Got, we primarily got the inspiration for this training uh, by creating a legislative and advocacy toolkit, which was emailed to all of the registrants this morning. We'll be talking about the toolkit throughout this presentation and alluding to it here and there. Um, there are aspects of this presentation that divert from the toolkit, so it is not strictly a presentation about the toolkit, uh, but you will notice that a lot of what we're covering is inspired by the toolkit and my colleagues will be speaking more about this later on. Before we get into all of our actual content, I wanna go over some housekeeping so that things can run as smoothly as possible today. We ask that you remain muted throughout the duration of today's presentation. For the last half hour or so of the presentation, there will be a question and answer section. And during that time, if you would like to unmute to ask a question or make a comment, you will be welcome to do so at that time. But up until that time, we ask that you remain muted. You will notice that captions are available in Zoom during today's presentation. You can enable captions by pressing the show captions button to turn them on. ASL interpretation is also available throughout the duration of today's presentation. The presenters will be available to uh, will be visible at all times alongside the ASL interpreter. Please let Dave Dresner know in the chat if at any point you are unable to see the interpreter. You do not to be you do not need to be on Zoom video in order to access today's presentation. All content is going to be described and all questions posted in the chat will be read out loud so that all content will be available to individuals who are calling in on the phone or who cannot see visual content. You'll notice that the public chat has been turned off, but you are still able to send chat messages to the hosts and co-hosts. If you experience any technical issues throughout today's presentation, you can send those questions directly to Dave Dresner in the chat if you have questions about the actual content and the different things we are discussing in the presentation itself, you can submit those questions in the chat either to Sarah Basehart or to Danielle Bustos. Note that if the chat is not accessible to you, you can submit questions in a variety of other ways as well. If you do submit questions in the chat, we will hold all of your questions until the end and read them aloud during the question and answer session. If the chat is not accessible to you, you can submit questions through a variety of other ways. As I mentioned earlier, you can also unmute yourself during the question and answer session and wait to be recognized and we will recognize you when you can speak your question aloud. You can also email your question to me if the chat is not accessible to you. I'm going to speak my email address out loud and I ask that one of my colleagues here put my email address in the chat as well. I will also be giving this again at the beginning of the question and answer session. To speak my email address out loud, that is hwilliams at imagemd.org. That's hwilliams at imagemd.org. If you're only on the phone with us today and want to participate in the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation, 
you can do so by pressing star nine and we will acknowledge you and you can ask your question. This is the first time that this particular legislative committee of the Maryland Statewide Independent Living Council is putting on a presentation like this in a virtual format. So we do ask for your patience as we work through any technical difficulties uh, and adjust to the Zoom environment. So we really appreciate you all being here. Uh, we're grateful for this opportunity and we hope it all goes smoothly. We will do all in our power to make sure that it does. We hope that these accessibility and logistics tips have been helpful for you. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Erin Ashinghurst, who is gonna uh, start by going over the toolkit. Thanks, Erin. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much, Henley, for that warm welcome to the presentation. Uh, again, I am Erin Ashinghurst, the Deputy Director of Programs and Services at Accessible Resources for Independence. We are the Center for Independent Living that serves people in Howard and Anne Arundel County, Maryland. And I am a white woman and my pronouns are she, her. Um, again, as Hindley mentioned, I will be going over a bit of an introduction to this toolkit. We want to outline the purpose and goals of the legislative toolkit, as well as describe a little bit of how you can get the most out of this toolkit. So the Independent Living Committee, um, we're really sharing this advocacy toolkit for the purpose of expanding the Maryland Statewide Independent Living Council or the Maryland SILC and Center for Independent Living State Legislative Advocacy. We want this to be a guidebook that is supportive to our network, including everyone here, to advocate for legislative changes and it's also aligned with the public policy platform, which was shared with everybody who is attending today. So our focused purpose is to successfully advocate for our funding request, which is included in the fiscal year 24 state budget. And our goal for 2023 and 2024 is to empower our independent living network to advocate for increased funding, for the silk and sills. So how do we get the most out of this toolkit? Many of us uh, know that public policy impacts how we as people with disabilities live in the community and policy and systems change uh, can make healthy community living feasible for people with disabilities in our community. Direct advocacy for systems change is also done with policymakers by our independent living network through participation in meetings, committees, work groups, and discussing policy issues. Whether you're a disability advocate who is seasoned or a new disability ally, we all have an opportunity here to engage with this toolkit and public policy platform so that we can influence policy change. And this toolkit aims to inform our audience about policies that are most important to the Maryland IL network and to provide us with detailed tools uh, to help people with disabilities and their support networks engage in systems advocacy. So a little bit about systems thinking, um, and there'll be more details about this in the toolkit. In terms of shaping policy and making systems change, there are important steps that take place. And again, I invite you to really reference that policy toolkit and spend some time with it in order to explore what we call the five steps towards policy change. And as you're reviewing those, really ask yourself what role you play and how you can be an active participant in influencing policy change for the disability community. Today, it's most important that we get a sense of how the Maryland legislative process works. And to do that, we will start the uh, presentation with a YouTube video called How a Bill Becomes a Law, a look into the Maryland legislative process. So now I will pass it over to Sarah. And I just want to make a note to the interpreters that this, this is captioned. This video is captioned.
We have no audio. Sarah, we don't have audio. Um, if anybody can hear me, and Mike, we don't have any audio. Yeah, hang on one second. Does anyone have any advice on why the audio, when we tried it Friday, the audio was there? There's a checkbox when you go to share screen that all, that one must check in order to make sure that audio is also being shared. Okay, wait a second. I think I just, I wonder why that would have cleared out. Okay, one second. Going through this process, a couple of years ago, um, I had a woman come to me with her daughter. Um, her daughter's name was Peyton. Peyton, uh, when she was, I think, six years old, got cancer. Um, and, you know, obviously very difficult time for Peyton, very difficult time for her family. Um, luckily, the type of cancer Peyton got was a relatively survivable form of cancer, and she immediately went into treatment. But many kids who get cancer at that age go into something called home and hospital teaching because they, while they're getting their chemo, they can't sort of participate in the classroom like they normally do. Um, and that home and hospital teaching, a lot of parents argue, I would argue, is inadequate. It's really only a, a, a couple days a week of essentially tutoring, um, and it doesn't sort of replace what a kid is getting in the classroom. So Peyton's mom did something interesting. She approached Cisco and got an early prototype of a robot that they were developing for classroom use. And basically the way it worked is that Peyton could sit in her hospital bed and remotely control the robot that was in her classroom in her school. And she could see everything that was happening in the classroom. Everybody could see her face on the screen. She could even raise and lower the arm the screen was on in order to ask a question. Really amazing educational technology. Well, Peyton and her mom had come to me and said, this should be available to more kids. So um, I went to the drafters in DLS and said, I want you to write a bill to create a great grant program to help fund school systems buying this type of technology to make it more available. And then when session started in January, um, two years ago, we introduced the bill. Um, I should mention also that I'm in the house uh, just as a, sort of a safety measure. Um, we often will seek somebody in the other chamber. So I had a senator, in this case, Senator Andy Serafini from Western Maryland, who introduced the exact same bill on the Senate side. That way, if my bill moves and his doesn't, we've still got a bill moving. If my bill doesn't move, but his does, we still have a bill moving, kind of like hedging your bets. So then the bill's introduced. Uh, we have what's called first reader or first reading. The bill's assigned to a committee. In this case, that bill was assigned to the Ways and Means Committee. Each committee has a, a sort of discrete set of issue areas. So in the House of Delegates, Ways and Means does election law, education policy, taxes, gambling, horse racing. Um, and any bill in any of those areas comes to my committee. Every bill that's introduced by uh, a deadline early in session gets a hearing. It's not like Congress where you introduce a bill and some bills are just never heard from again. Every bill gets a hearing. Anybody, don't even have to be a resident of Maryland, anybody can sign up to testify in person or to submit written testimony, okay? And then at that point, if a subcommittee chooses to bring up a bill, then that bill will be voted on by the subcommittee, voted on by the full committee. 
If the committee supports the bill, it goes to what's called second read or, or second reading, where the bill is reported out to the floor. So the whole House of Delegates gets to hear that we say this is a good bill. We give it what's called a favorable report. At that point, members of the House will ask questions or they will offer floor amendments, uh, try to amend the bill, change the bill in some way. And, uh, and there, there's no formal vote taken at the end of second reader. It's sort of a pro forma thing that it passes on to third reader. Third reader happens a couple days later. And at that point, there's a final vote, a recorded vote on the piece of legislation. Um, so once you've done all of that complicated process, you have to start all over again, because at that point, your bill crosses over. It goes to the other chamber. Um, in my case, it goes from the House over to the Senate. And then we have to go through the whole process again on the Senate side. Um, and so that often the crossing over part happens towards the end of the legislative session in late March and early April. We usually end by the second week of April. Um, a couple other things to mention. The budget is a very powerful tool. Um, and this is something that it takes people a long time to figure out in Annapolis. It takes advocates a long time to figure out. But you can often get done exactly what you, what you want to get done through legislation through the budget. For example, um, I happen to rely more on legislation because I'm on uh, the Ways and Means Committee, a policy committee instead of a budget committee. But I probably could have gotten that same bill introduced in the budget instead of a piece of legislation. Um, in the case, by the way, of Peyton's bill, um, we got the bill through the House. It passed through the Senate. The governor signed it. The next year, the governor appropriated funding for it. So there is now a grant program uh, in the budget for providing that type of educational technology to schools. And it literally all started with this mother and her, her at the time, eight-year-old daughter coming in to talk to me about it. Um, that's how you know easy it is to sort of get an idea rolling in Annapolis. It's much easier than it is in Capitol Hill. Um, finally, I'll just mention before we, I want to show you something else and then we get to questions. Um, the, the quality of advocacy Okay, we're ready to go to Lorna May. I apologize, I was muted, thank you. Um, my name is Lorna May Silcott. Um, I am an advocate for the Freedom Center um, and I'm an African-American female. So right now we're gonna talk about Excuse me. How to find your legislators. Um, first, you will go to www.mdelect.net. That is www.mdelect.net. Okay, that's, that's the website you will go to. On the left side, and Danielle, let me know if I'm going too fast. On the left side of Give your- Give me a second, Hold on. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. I'm okay. trying to find the- And we'll wait for Danielle. Okay, there we go. So we the can show you. Up. Okay. On the left side of the screen, you will see at the top, elected officials near me. Under elected officials near me, it reads search for an address or locate on a map. Under that, it asks you to enter your address, street, town, state, or zip code. Click on enter or the magnifier or the computer may have your address pop up and then you can click on that. Now, once you've clicked on your address, you will see the following your elected officials, governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, controller, et cetera. Next, you will see your federal senators and representatives. Everyone in Maryland has the same senators. Each person's federal legislator in the House of Representatives will be different depending on your address. The computer will show you the name of your representative and your district. The districts are determined, like I mentioned earlier, by your address. 
onto the federal legislators, you will find a list, okay, including state senators, your district number, which is based on your address. Now your senators will be listed next. Next, you will find your state delegates and district number based on your address. The name of each delegate will be listed. Now, what do you do with this info? Well, I'm glad you asked. Simply click on the name of a state senator or delegate and you will find the following. The person's name, address, phone number, email, and a paragraph on their history um, and work as a legislator. You will read about their work on committees and more. And that is how you find your information. Thank you. Now on to Lori. Thank you, Lorna May. Good afternoon, IO partners. I'm Lori Elanoff. My, proton, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white Caucasian female and I'm 68 years old. So I've been, a, I've been around the block a little bit with this advocacy business. So how do you take your passion and make it happen? Now that you have all your information about your legislators, you can, you can read this, get a, get a little background, find out what committees they're on and what kind of work they've done. You can always make a nice compliment about that. But how do you make an appointment with your legislator? You can email them and you have that information or you can call them. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a kind of a dry run through on what, I, what I've done when I've contacted my legislators. Get the phone number, call them up and they'll answer the phone, hello. Delegate Kipke's office, I'll say, hello. My name is Laurie Elanoff and I am one of the delegate's constituents. I'm a person with a disability. Now I'm gonna be in Annapolis on Tuesday, February 7th. And I'd like to come in and, and talk, talk with the delegate about issues that concern his constituents with disabilities, as well as the types of services that I can provide for you. I'm working with the Center for Independent Living and our center will provide his constituents, many services, and I'd like to dis discuss those. So most likely you're going to be talking with a staff person and they'll set up an, they'll set up an appointment and they may say, you know, the delegate may or may not be here, but, but you'll have someone to talk with. Great. And nine times out of 10, you're gonna be talking with a staff, a staff person who has knowledge about issues people with disabilities and this is a very good thing don't in any way think that you're getting second best by by not by talking with the staff person these people are the eyes and ears for the representative and trust me you want to make this person your best friend so that's how you make an appointment and take it away Hinley. thanks so much Lori. this is all really helpful so I'm going to speak a little bit about how to actually make this now, now that you've got your hypothetical meeting scheduled, we're going to talk about how to make this meeting happen. How do we structure it? What do we talk about? So the first thing I'm going to say is Lori made a note about email or, and phone calls, two very different types of ways to reach out to make your appointment. There are a range of levels with comfortability with technology among legislators. I have met with legislators in person. I've met with legislators on Zoom. I've met with legislators who never want to see Zoom again, but we weren't able to meet in person. So we set up a conference call line to speak via phone. So there are a wide range of comfortability levels among legislators and among their staffers um, in terms of how the meeting, what, what medium the meeting is actually going to be in. So, you know, feel free to adjust to, you know, whatever is going to work best for them. Of course, if there is an access barrier with any of those different uh, methods that I mentioned, then you, that will need to come first. So you'll need to make that known. But otherwise, I recommend adjusting to whatever the staffer or the legislator is most comfortable with. 
I want to go over a couple of quick do's and don'ts before I go into the actual meeting structure. So these folks, these legislators and these staffers, they're reading all day long and they're going to presentations where they're listening to people read all day long. And so one way to stand out is to not read during your presentation. Now it's understandable that you wanna get everything right in your presentation. You wanna make sure you're getting your facts and figures correct. You wanna make sure that you're naming the any, any specificities that you have. You wanna make sure those are correct. So it's okay to go in with some notes or a bulleted list. I always do that <laughs> so that I can make sure that I don't leave anything out. But not reading your presentation and actually putting things in your own words and having a conversation is really going to stand out to that person because they're not seeing that every day. So I highly recommend putting things in your own words and keeping as few notes as possible only to keep yourself on track using notes to only keep, keep things going um, and keeping your outline together the more energy and personalization you can bring to your presentation the better that's also going to be really really important another really important point that Lori mentioned that i think is a really good one when we think about these meetings, we're talking about what we need from the legislators, and we need a lot from them. They, they control money, they control policy, they control lots of things that affect people with disabilities and independent living in the state of Maryland. But Lori very intelligently pointed out that it's also important to make sure that we can make them aware that we are a resource for them. So if they are getting phone calls from the community, from folks with disabilities, they can, you know, we can make them aware that they can always send those folks to the Center for Independent Living that is located in that particular jurisdiction. So that's something really cool that we can highlight. You know, we're always here as a resource for your folks who give you a call, who, who have disabilities or someone's calling on behalf of someone with a disability. That's something that we can offer to folks. So coming with business cards is really helpful or being prepared to copy and paste contact information for your sensor into the Zoom chat or read it out loud on the phone or send it in an email. That's going to be really important as well. That's a nice personal touch. Um, now I want to go over what actually appears in the toolkit. So um, I'm going to go over the outline. You all, this will be very familiar to you when you go into the toolkit and you look at the sample meeting script. When you are speaking with your legislators, it's important that your words count. You want your words to be meaningful. You want your words to be concise. You want them to be personal. So I'm going to go through a little bit of a formula to what makes a successful meeting. Step one, your introduction. Everyone who's in the meeting, whether it's just you or whether it's you and a team of colleagues, everybody's going to want to share their name, their organization and job title. If you're a volunteer, be sure to say what you volunteer for. A brief description of what you do and who you serve. Our centers are really unique because we serve individuals with disabilities and we pay attention to their concerns in a very personalized way. So highlighting that is really important because we have a direct link as service providers with individuals in terms of how these services are directly affecting them. So that's a very important position for them to be aware of. It's a very important relationship that we have to their constituents. It's also really important, this is just kind of a, a manners, politeness, formality thing, making sure to express gratitude in the introduction for folks meeting with you for taking the time to meet. So moving on to the next part of the outline, the step two in having a successful meeting is outlining the problem. And that can take several different forms. If you're trying to ask for more funding, it will be important to outline the gaps in services that are going on because there aren't, there isn't enough funding to keep all the services together. If the problem is something else, 
maybe you're wanting them to support a particular piece of legislation or uh, you know, you're trying to help them understand why something matters, some particular issue. Um, outlining the issue, what, why it's important, who is suffering because of this issue, who is not benefiting, um, that's all going to be really important, making that very clear and making it very personal. In either case, whether you're outlining gaps in services or whether you're outlining a specific need that's not being met, it's really important to employ a lot of different tactics in order to make your point clear. So an example of a, a tactic that you might employ is statistics. So an example of a basic statistic would be one out of five Americans identifies as a person with a disability. So that might be something that, you know, that's an example of a statistic. Your statistics should be specific to your situation and what you're discussing. Another important way to illustrate the problem is storytelling. We're going to talk a little bit more about storytelling later on in this presentation, but whether you're working, you're telling a story about someone that you're working with, or you're telling a story, uh, the individual who the story happened to is actually sharing it. Storytelling is very personal. It's very impactful, and it's a great way to get your point across. Moving on to the third part of our formula to, to have a successful meeting is the solution. So you'll discuss the legislation that you're trying to get them to support or not support and describe how it's going to address the problem. You wanna make sure you've got that link between this, the problem and the solution and making sure to address how exactly that problem is going to be solved. Um, be direct about your ask and make sure that it is very clear what you're trying to get them to support. The fourth step here in our formula is to invite questions and comments, and uh, they may have some, they may not, um, and invite them to ask any questions that they might have, make any comments, and thank them again for their time at this point. You can ask for any contact information. By this point, you will have either had their phone number or their email address because you will have spoken to them to create the meeting in the first place. But if they have specific contact information that they want you to use, now would be a good time to ask that. Now would be a good time to also offer your contact information, talk about services that you may be able to provide for their constituents with disabilities. And of course, again, a sort of gratitude sandwich, if you will, thanking them for their time in the beginning and then closing out by thanking them for their time at the end. And I'm going to turn things back over to Lori, who's going to offer some helpful tips on the follow-up. Thank you, Henley. Now that you've had this fantastic meeting in your legislator's office, you want to you wanna send them, a, again, a thank you note, a written note expressing your appreciation for the time, et cetera. And you also want to include that nice picture that you took with them in the office. Be that picture with the legislator, be that picture with the staff. I've done, I've made a practice of doing this and trust me, they will remember you. They'll be happy to see you when you come back. It, it makes a difference. So I highly recommend doing that. Um, also with follow-up, let's say you were talking about a specific piece of legislation and, and the legislation is being heard within a couple of days, let's say the first hearing, you're going to want to know, you're going to want to follow up and find out if, how, let's, let's, say, let's say the bill was being heard in a couple of weeks, for example. You want, to, you want to find out the members of that committee and contact them and tell them what you want, if you want the bill to pass or not, and give some personal information in your story, but you can call them, you can email them, you can do both, but let your voice be heard. You know, it's in all likelihood, you're obviously not going to be the, the constituent of every legislator on that committee, but we serve people with disabilities all over the state. And so their constituents are being addressed by this legislation. So make, make those contacts, follow up, and um, that's very important. So I think that's all I have with follow-up right now, except to say that um, 
by doing these things and keeping in contact with your legislator's office that, and letting them know that they can contact you, that's called building a relationship and that will really help you in the future. And if you ever have any questions about where, where a bill is or what's going on, that staff will be available to help you. And, and if you've made a nice contact with them, they'll be happy, they'll be happy to help you. Thank you very much. Great. I think next we're moving to Danielle. Hi, thank you. This is Danielle. Um, uh, Danielle Bustos. I work for Independence Now, which uh, we serve people with disabilities in Montgomery and Prince George's County. And I am a white Latina. Please excuse my purple screen as I'm having some technical difficulty this, this morning, this afternoon. Um, so I'm just going to um, start off by mentioning hang on one second general. danielle we lost the interpreters just let they get them back to the front okay hold on everybody <laughs> my great technical skills have finally really come to bear i'll be i wonder I'll be right if with everyone since danielle's also a host does she maybe have to spotlight them while she's speaking I do not know. Let me find them again and spotlight them. There's one. Let me get the other one. It does not let me. Sorry. <sighs> it's a great chance while Dave's doing this, if you already know questions that you're going to have to ask when we get to the Q&A, you're welcome to put them in the chat to me or Danielle while you have a minute. It won't. Let me spotlight, but if I remove all the spotlights, sorry, everyone. And we practiced this last week too, just so everyone knows. So we can spotlight for everyone, but then it, won't let me spotlight anyone else anymore. What about pinning the other interpreter? If I hit pin, it says remove all spotlighted videos. Pinning is, uh, we'll remove, Paula will remove all spotlighted videos for everyone. Do, you mind, do we have a video that's up? Because that was what was about to happen was one going to be shown. Maybe that actually helped. It would allow me to spotlight Danielle at this moment. And And Lisa. I just pinned them both. Oh. Does it let me do that? So now I have both of them, both of the interpreters up, and now I have to try to pin. But pinning only works for you. It doesn't work for the group. Oh, well then let's undo that. Okay, now maybe spotlighting will actually work. And it's not letting us spotlight Paula because her camera's off. So we need Paula to turn her camera on for a minute, I think. 
Oh, just momentarily. Yeah. Thank you, Paula. Okay, one more. Ah, I got it. I'm going back on mute. Thank you, Dave. Um, so I was gonna start off with um, some general information about um, the silk and the sills. Um, these are referenced in the toolkit. Um, so if you would like to take a look at that, uh, you can. Um, I'm gonna show two videos. The first, uh, two short videos. The first is how to make an M my MGA account uh, on the MGA legislative website, my MGA website. And the second video is going to be how to sign up to testify uh, to for a testimony on the my MGA website. The first, um, give me one second, I'm going to share my screen now. So this is the My MGA website. The official website name is mgaleg.malin.gov slash MGA website. And we are going to show this video. Hopefully the sound will be recognized. If you are someone who wants to actively participate in the Maryland legislative process, MyMGA is for you. When you have a MyMGA account, you can track bill activity through our automated system. Also with an account, you can sign up to be a witness at a bill hearing and provide testimony. But before you can do anything, you have to create an account. It won't take more than a minute. Here's how. Click the MyMGA icon at the top right of the MGA website. Click Create a MyMGA Tracking Account or click Register. Enter the requested information in the fields. Click the Register button. Go to your email program and open the confirmation email. Follow the directions to complete the registration. Your browser will open and you will see the Account Registration Complete window. Follow the directions to sign in. Enter your email and password and click Sign In. Your account is all set! Each time you log in to your MyMGA account, the landing page is the Bill Tracking Lists page. This is where you'll set up lists of bills to track. We'll show you how to do that in another video. For now, we want to show you a couple of other things about your account. Should you need to change your password, select Change Password from the menu. Select Edit Account to change your account information. If you ever want to cancel or unsubscribe your account, select Cancel Account from the menu. This will immediately delete your account and a new one will need to be created if you wish to track bills in the future. Refer to the FAQ document as another source of help with MyMGA. Use the Sign Out button to log out of your account. We hope that you have learned how to create your MyMGA account. If you have any questions or comments, go to the footer at the bottom of the page and select Contact Us. Click Send Feedback to send an email to webmaster at mgadls.state.md.us. Thank you for visiting the Maryland General Assembly website. Um, I would like to add when signing up for the My MGA account, the information that it was requesting. Um, it was your name, 
your email, your address, and uh, to set up a password. I just wanted to make sure that that was that was clear. Um, now we're going to show the second video, which is how to sign up for a testimony. And this video as part of the Maryland legislative process, this video will go through um, uh, the different steps to either submit written testimony or uh, oral testimony. Standing committees meet during session to receive testimony and take action on bills referred to the committee. Bill sponsors, citizens, and other parties supporting or opposing legislation have an opportunity to submit oral and written testimony at the bill hearing. If you wish to provide testimony on a bill, you must have a MyMGA account. Refer to our video for directions on how to create one. When you are signed into MyMGA, click Witness Sign Up from the menu. The landing page for witness testimony shows the available hearing schedules, grouped by committee, that have bills that are accepting or allowing testimony. I want to testify on House Bill 260. I know it's being heard by the Senate Finance Committee, so I'll use the committee's drop-down to filter the list. Now I can see all the bills scheduled to be heard by the Finance Committee and that are accepting testimony. If I didn't see the bill I was looking for, it probably means that the committee is not accepting testimony for that bill at this time. Lucky for me, I can see House Bill 260 right here. Now I need to select a position from the drop-down. My testimony for this bill is favorable. Then I need to select the type of testimony I'm going to provide. I'm going to provide both oral and written testimony for this bill, so I'll choose both. Oh look! The Upload Files button just became active. This is because I'm providing written testimony and I'll need to upload it before I can save my sign up. To do this, I'll click the Upload Files button. Now I need to select the files for my computer. They must be PDF files or the system will not save my sign up. I can upload up to 10 PDF files, but I only have two, so I'll click Choose Files and select them both and click Open. I will click OK to close the window. I want to double check that this bill is selected by confirming there is a check mark in the box next to the bill number. There it is! Finally, I need to click Save to upload the files for my testimony and to save my sign up. If you sign up to provide oral testimony in a House committee, you'll see a pop-up window letting you know that spaces for oral testimony are limited and check your email for next steps. I'll click OK to close that. Once your sign up is saved, that Upload Files button becomes an Edit Files button. If I want to remove a file that was uploaded, I need to click the Edit Files button and uncheck the box next to the file I want to remove. I can add new files while I'm here if I need to, but I don't, so I'll just click OK and then click Save one last time. This Cancel button will refresh the page and reset any changes that were made after the last time you saved. If you want to see a list of the bills that you signed up for, click the Signed Up Items button. If you see something that needs changing, like your position, then click Witness Sign Up from the left-hand menu. Find the bill and make the changes, just like when you signed up the first time. Don't forget, save your changes by clicking the Save button. For questions about your witness testimony sign up for a bill or for procedural information about witness testimony sign up, contact the committee assigned to the bill and refer to their guidelines. If you have any questions or comments, go to the footer at the bottom of the page and select Contact Us. Click Send Feedback to send an email to webmaster at mgadls.state.md.us. Thank you for visiting the Maryland General Assembly website. Okay, and now I will uh, turn it over to Sarah. Muted.
Unmute Sarah. Got it. Sorry. Thank you. Only three years in. Um, my name's Sarah Basehart. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a white woman. I'm the executive director of Independence Now, the SIL that serves Prince George's and Montgomery counties, and I'm the co-chair of the Independent Living Legislative Committee with Hindley. I've been involved in politics and around legislative work since I was a little kid, and it really bothers me when people say that all politicians are crooks or that they don't want to be involved in politics because it's dirty. Uh, the reasons that this bothers, the reason this bothers me is because the changes that we want to see and the changes that the disability community deserves are only going to happen when people speak up about what's wrong. And I don't mean high powered, high paid lobbyists or figureheads of organizations. I mean real people telling real stories. So uh, Hindley mentioned earlier that we would be talking about telling personal stories. And this is the section of the presentation where we're gonna do that. Telling stories is one of the best ways to get the attention of legislators. Legislators spend a lot of time reading data and listening to budget reports and bureaucratic reasons about why they should or shouldn't vote for things. Even when they think they know a lot about an issue like home care attendant services, when we tell them real stories about what happens when attendants quit because they can make more money or have better hours other places and what them quitting does to the lives of people with disabilities, it's far more meaningful than any bit of data or any study of budgets. Don't get me wrong, they need all that boring information too, um, but what they're going to remember is the story you tell them because that makes things real and it makes them want to act and create change. I've heard legislators retell our personal stories in hearings when talking about complex issues because the stories are what change their minds or make them pay attention to an issue that they didn't even know existed. In our toolkit is a storytelling section where you can use seven steps, which each step has a question to tell your story. So just to give you a little taste of kind of what that tool is about, and you're welcome to look at it when you have time. Here, it walks you through introducing yourself. Um, the first section is what happened. Tell the most important or compelling things about your situation. Um, what helped? What services and supports did you receive that helped to solve the problem? Why are things better now than they were before? What is the problem and what will help to solve that problem? And then the last piece is that you make the ask, if you have one, if you're asking them uh, uh, to vote a certain way or do something specific, take an action in a specific way, then you want to ask at the end of your story. So the goal of the story tool is to help get all the pieces of information that are important to telling a personal story. But these sections can certainly be arranged in different ways and still tell a really succinct story. Even the committee couldn't quite agree on exactly the order. Um, we've put the, the best way we think forward, but it's a guide and you can choose to rearrange these sections as you um, choose when you're going to tell a story. So I hope you'll you'll try that and um, use that tool to tell personal stories or support consumers to um, tell personal stories that make a difference at, at in legislative hearings and when we're working on different issues in Annapolis. The second topic that I'm going to cover is about lobbying and advocacy. There are a couple times while I'm speaking about this topic that I'm going to read direct quotes from resources. This is a very nuanced issue and it's really important that I give you clear information. And of course you're welcome to ask questions during our Q&A time. Um, and I ask you to understand that I, I'm skimming the surface and that many specific situations with legislative work should be analyzed individually and thought about individually as far as whether they are lobbying or advocacy. So SILs and the SILC are all encouraged to advocate. Systems advocacy is even one of our core services. According to a fact sheet from ACL, our federal funders, 
Advocacy is the act of engaging with government officials to educate and provide technical, factual, and nonpartisan information about relevant issues. For example, a grantee could meet with an elected official to provide information about grant activities and educate them about the beneficiaries of those activities. They may also respond to written requests from government officials for testimony. Advocacy is permissible, is a permissible use of federal funding and certain ACL grantees, including the SILs, are required to engage in advocacy. So legislative advocacy can quickly slip into lobbying. <laughs> and it's not to say that the SILs or the SILC can't lobby, but staff cannot be paid with federal grant dollars when they're engaging in lobbying. So let's talk for a minute about what lobbying is and how it differs from advocacy. So according to the National Council on Nonprofits, lobbying is communicating with decision makers, that's elected officials and their staff, about existing or potential legislation and urging a vote for or against. So all three of those components of this definition are required decision makers, actual legislation or potential legislation, and asking for a vote. So in other words, if members of the SILC or the SIL, or SIL staff are talking with elected officials about a current piece of legislation or something that they know is going to become legislation, and they're asking them to support or oppose that bill, that's lobbying flat out. It, re, it hits all three of the questioning areas. If you're only sharing best practices of the disability community or you're having people tell personal stories about the topic of legislation, that's advocacy. It's when you shift to talking specifically about a bill and asking them to vote a certain way that it shifts to lobbying. So the SILs are gonna work on, uh, hopefully, <laughs> a funding effort that's gonna be discussed in a, in a minute. And we, we all need to understand that time spent working on that cannot be recorded or paid by federal IL dollars because it is lobbying. I have confirmed this with our um, technical assistance folks. You'll be speaking about funding that's hopefully in a budget bill next year, and you'll be asking them to support that funding. So that's very specific lobbying. Now, you can go and speak with elected officials about the services that your SIL provides, the things that the SILC is working on. You can share stories, give examples of all the amazing things our IL community has done, and how much more we could do if we had additional funding for those services and for our SILC. And that would all be advocacy. But as soon as you speak directly about the budget and ask for a vote in favor, then you're lobbying. So I just want to be sure that that's clear, the, the, the nuances, the three, three rule test um, to make sure. And you can ask questions when we move to Q&A. Um, another just couple pieces to understand because folks get very nervous when we start talking about lobbying. We don't necessarily need to be registered lobbyists to do this work. It's very unlikely that the work that most of the SILs or even a SILC um, paid staff um, would be considered substantial. So many people think that nonprofits can't ever lobby. Many people think that, and that's just not true. Um, per the IRS rules, and I'm quoting, churches and other organizations exempt under Section 501c3 are allowed to lobby, but their lobbying is limited. The general rule is that lobbying may not be more than an insubstantial part of their overall activities. Now it's vague, right? Because it's the IRS, so it's, it's vague. But you can do some lobbying, but not too much lobbying, and keep your 501c3. So I think one of the ways that I tend to think about this is how much money is an organization spending on the time that's considered lobbying, and then compare that to your organizational budget and you'll have some idea of whether it might be considered substantial or insubstantial. There's also Maryland laws um, about registering as a lobbyist, which anybody can do. 
Um, you can learn more specifics with the Maryland Ethics Board. They're the folks that oversee and register lobbyists and you take a training and you pay a fee and you do some reporting. It, none of it is hard to do, but it is a different level of, um, of commitment to uh, reporting and lobbying. In general, if someone's gonna earn more than $2,500 or more than $2,500 worth of someone's time is gonna be spent doing face-to-face -face lobbying, then you should register as a lobbyist. Or if you're going to earn or more than $5,000 worth of someone's time is gonna be used calling elected officials, sending letters, emails, attending Zoom sessions with them, then you should register as a lobbyist. So that's a couple of the, the key dollar points that the Maryland Ethics Board uses in, in the legislation around lobbyists. Hopefully this information is helpful and now I'm gonna turn it over to Dave. And I did the same thing. I started talking while I was still muted. <laughs> hey, everyone. It's good to see you all. I really actually just want to say, wow, I was so excited um, to see so many people register because it feels like it's really been a long time since we've all, I know it's virtual. And with the spotlighting, I can't really see you all on like my computer screen all at once. But I know that you're there. And that makes me really excited. And I didn't want to pass up the opportunity to just say that and I hope that we have lots more opportunities for this and some in-person ones um, in the future. We're having an open house on February 20th if you want to come. I mean January 20th, next Friday. Just saying. Anyway, I want to talk to you today about um, our funding request um, that we are gearing up to ask the state legislator. Um, so to reiterate uh, again, what Sarah just went over, when, if you are asking specifically for money, which we want to do, um, we're making a specific request to decision makers, that is lobbying. Um, no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Uh, all that, the extra time, uh, massaging, um, uh, uh, relationships uh, with decision makers and talking about our core services and the great work that SILs do, that is advocacy. Uh, as soon as we round that corner to say, and by the way, we need more money for this, um, now we're lobbying. So just putting that out there. Um, okay, so what is our request? We are asking for an additional million dollars um, to bring each Center for Independent Living up to what is called base level funding. Um, base level funding is in our current spill. That's the state plan on independent living. Uh, it is defined in that plan uh, as 365,000. Uh, and it can be a combination of federal or state dollars, uh, but those are federal and state dollars that can be used for general operating expenses. So I can use them. Oh, I didn't introduce myself. Let me start all over. Hi, Dave Dresner. I am the executive director of the Freedom Center. We're the SIL that serves Carroll and Frederick counties. I am a white male and I use he, him pronouns. Um, sorry, I forgot that part. So base level funding is a concept that is what's the bare minimum that a Center for Independent Living needs to be able to function. And that, that would be funds that are not specific or restricted to a specific area. So I can use them or the Center for Independent Living can use them um, to help pay overhead costs, administrative costs, salary costs, travel costs, all of that, all, all of the costs that are inherent in actually having an organization and, and running uh, a center for independent living that sometimes you're not allowed to use uh, the funding that you get 
for specific things in those more general ways. A great uh, illustration of that that would affect every cell um, uh, is all of the cells in Maryland have the assistive technology grant program that allows us to do one of the things that I, I love the best, which is actually um, purchase assistive technology or home modif or vehicle home or vehicle modifications for individuals that immediately impact their life in a positive way, right? Like just an immediate sense of helping someone gain more independence. <clears throat> and but most of that money that we get is directly to be spent on the consumers that we're serving. And a tiny little portion of it uh, is spent on actually paying for the cost of the program. That means the salary of the person who's actually running, person or persons who are actually running the program. And there's not really anything left over for supervising them or paying for any of the other expenses. In fact, I think for most sales, the amount that they're allowed to spend um, for that program on salaries doesn't pay a part-time salary even for a whole year. Um, certainly in the Freedom Center's case, it doesn't. And we have to use other funds to supplement to make sure that we can do that program. Um, so what we're really looking for is base operating funds um, <laughs> that allow us to really increase our five core services and all the additional services that the SILs uh, provide across the state. Um, to get each center for independent living to base level funding would take all rounding up, as I'll round up, would take almost a million dollars every year. Um, additionally, the State Independent Living Council needs additional funding to really be able to fully staff and implement um, the programs and, and the state plan on independent living and do the work that a, that a State Independent Living Council could really do if there was sufficient funding uh, to be able to do that. And there currently is not. So our plan includes um, about 10% of the ask that we're asking for centers to then also go to the SIL. Um, and then once we get to that million dollars of additional funding, we want an increase every year. I don't know about any of you, um, but it seems as though prices for goods and services and rent uh, go up every year. And uh, at least here at the Freedom Center, our general operating funding that we get um, is basically flat every year. I don't believe we've had an increase in funding from the state. Um, certainly we haven't had one from the state the entire time that, we've, that I've been at the Freedom Center, which is about to be four years. Um, I have heard that it's been much, much longer than that. Uh, so it's time. It's time for them, to, for the state to um, really um, get behind the independent living program um, with actual funding. So what we're asking for is a million dollars, which we would be, um, which we would split into two years. So basically half a million the first year and then the full million the second year. And then each additional year after that, a 5% increase in our state funding. Uh, I wanna be clear, this is additional funding. This is on top of any state funding that any Center for Independent Living is already receiving. Um, so it would be money that would need to be added into uh, the, the budget and then would be distributed to us through our designated state entity, which of course is DOORS. Um, but I was going to go over all the reasons why we need the money, but it occurs to me that we all work at Centers for Independent Living or on the State Independent Living Council, and we all know the reasons. But just to refresh, the state has not put money into independent living services that has kept up with inflation over the years at all. Uh, 
we have an additional core service uh, which of transition services, which we know is not really one service, but is two, maybe three, because that's nursing home transition, that's diversion, and that's youth transition. Um, with that additional uh, service being listed as a core service, there was no additional funding that we got. Um, and yet we have to continue to do that. I think we, all of the stills do a tremendous amount of housing case management, which has been, um, is critical for the people that we serve, um, but we do that without any reimbursement. Uh, and that can be incredibly time consuming and takes away from the other activities that we could also be doing or doesn't allow us to expand those activities. Uh, some centers for independent living cover very large territories. Uh, and so to provide services adequately, there's a lot of travel involved um, and we aren't adequately funded to reimburse for that travel. Uh, also, I, as I mentioned before, we all have the AT program and it is not fully funded in that it does not provide enough funds to actually pay for the salary and administrative costs to manage that program on an annual basis. So those are just some of the reasons uh, why it's really important that we start asking for money uh, and that we ask for money every year until we get money. Um, so we'll start asking for money as soon as possible. I went through the uh, toolkit and tried to use it to, to get some information that I thought uh, would be valuable when I would be getting ready to do an ask for funding. And so I just wanna talk about that just very, very briefly, because I learned some important things. One thing I learned is I went online to look up um, who my state legislators are and found that currently, as of this morning, still, maybe it's changed by the time we get off this training, but as of this morning, they had not updated the websites. So you may not actually get an accurate list of who your legislators are. Um, I know some of the changes that have happened in Frederick and Carroll County. And so that was a, a quick cue. It's like, wait a second, that person is not gonna be a Senator when they reconvene. Um, so be careful about that. Um, you might, even though I believe the legislative session starts on Wednesday, I believe it starts January 11th. Um, the, the websites don't, do not appear to be completely updated yet. Hopefully that will happen soon. But I also learned some good information. When you look up people, um, you find out what position, if they have a position in leadership and what committees that they're on. So in the last legislative session, um, uh, the minority whip of the Senate is actually uh, a Senator from Carroll County who represents Carroll County, which is one of my counties. So that's someone that I know today, um, I wanna, and, and I know he was reelected. So um, that's someone I wanna make sure that I have a relationship with and, and build a relationship with him and his staff because um, a minority whip is a leadership position within his party and, and within the body of, of the Senate. Um, I could also see what uh, delegates and Senator, what delegates, I was looking at delegates at this point, were on the Appropriations Committee, the Health and, Health and Government Operations Committees and other committees that would be relevant to uh, the ask that I'm going to make. Um, so I think that it's, uh, there's some great information within the toolkit that helps you really sort of build your, uh, your list of who you wanna to talk to and wh who would be the really important people to try to get in front of or build relationships with and, and be friendly with and be doing advocacy at that point. Um, and then on the storytelling part, um, looking at, you know, the, looking at in terms of the problem is a lack of funding for us as cells and we need additional funding um, and that can still be advocacy if you're not making a specific ask, but simply talking about unfunded mandates or um, the expansion of services 
uh, when you go to do an ask about funding, I think going back to the storytelling makes a lot of sense and really looking at um, what is your cell doing and what are the stories that are coming out of your cell and who are the people that you're serving and who are the people that we could serve better or more of them or both if we had additional funds to pay for that. Um, so that's really sort of in, in a nutshell, the, um, the, uh, the legislative ask and the funding narrative. There is a narrative document that we can pass it. We have to tweak it a little bit more. Um, and then we can make that available to people and you can really use that um, to help hone your message. Um, and I think that's all I got. So just to reiterate before we go to questions, um, we want to start asking for additional funding. We want the state to commit to additional funding. Uh, Maryland is one of the wealthiest states in the nation. There is a budget surplus. I know everyone is asking for a piece of that budget surplus, um, but we can all point to the amazingly good work that we do and the lives that we really, really um, impact in a positive way. Um, and so I think making a justification for uh, some of that additional funding uh, should be an easy ask. A million dollars might sound like a lot if, if you're like me and you work for a small center for independent living, <laughs> but in our state budget, a million dollars is nothing. It's not a big ask at all. Um, so, and just one last thing, one of the reasons to uh, ask for that in steps, 500,000 the first year, the full million the second year is so that each still really can ramp up their services and really be able to effectively spend that income, that additional dollars. Because while we're, while we'll say we are underfunded and we are, and we don't have enough money, obviously we are all making do with what we have. Um, and have done an amazing job of doing more with what is effectively less based on inflation um, over the years. But you can only do more with less for so long. And then you start doing less with less. And we don't want to end up doing less with less. So we need more. Um, that's, that's the big thing. So if you're excited about that, uh, or you can get excited about that, now is the time, not right this second, but now is the time. Um, to be thinking about that. And, and I hope that we energize people uh, and that we're really out there meeting our legislators uh, and, and making sure they know what the SILs are doing and what the SILC is doing and, and how valuable we really are in Maryland. And so that's my spiel. And I appreciate you all listening. Um, and I'm going to, I see that there's messages in the chat, which I can't multitask. So I've not looked at them while I've been talking. Um, I am going to turn it back over to Hindley, um, and she is going to lead us through uh, the question, I think I'm doing that right, uh, the question yeah. and answer session, and I'm going to unspotlight myself, because then I'll oh, feel right. better. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, this ends the formal presentation portion of today's training. We're going to now move into the question and answer session. Uh, before doing so, I want to thank each and every one of my colleagues who presented here today. It's great to work with you all and to see what's possible when we all work together and put our strengths together to make something great. Um, so I'm really grateful for each and every one of you. I'm grateful to all those of you who are here today and we're here to answer your questions now. We have about, about uh, 35 minutes and that this time is all for all of you. So I'm gonna open the floor in just a moment here for questions and answers. To outline things a little bit, uh, I wanna go over the four different ways that you can submit questions. The first way is to put chat messages in the chat to, and you can send those questions to Danielle Bustos or to Sarah Basehart. The second way is to simply unmute and request permission to speak. Um, and in order to avoid talking over one another, please wait until one of us recognizes you, uh, just so that everyone feels like they can have a chance to speak if they would like to. 
The third way is to send me an email. I'm going to speak my email address out loud and I'm going to ask one of my colleagues to put it in the chat for me. That email address is hwilliams at imagemd.org. And I will continue to refresh my email throughout the Q&A. So feel free to send those at any point. The fourth and final way is if you're on the phone with us, you can press star nine and we will recognize you to speak. And I'm gonna ask my colleagues who have an eye on the chat. I think that if you press star nine, it comes up as a raised hand. So if you could keep an eye on that as well so that we can catch any raised hands from our phone participants. So now at this time, without further ado, I am gonna open it up to questions. I have one, if you want me to start, Dave said he also has some in the chat, so I'll start here. Uh, Julie Randall asks, when a bill is coming up, should we let our legislators in our districts know that we are also contacting committee members and maybe get advice from our legislators on who best to contact? It's a stellar idea in my opinion. <laughs> um, yes, it's always nice to make those contacts and uh, the committee members who who want to add to that? Um, yes, if you if you don't have a local, as Dave was referring to, you know, if you don't have a local person on a committee, which we won't all have local people on every single, you know, every single committee or in leadership roles, it's always good to ask your own legislators. You know, we have a bill going to this committee. Do you have advice on anybody we should talk to? I think that's a terrific idea. But you also want to be sure your legislator knows too, because ultimately, then the bill goes back to the full you know, Senator House for a vote. And so you want them to know about it as well. Thank you, good question. Any, any other committee members wanna to add to that? This is Hindley, I just wanna add that, you know, that really goes along with a lot of the stuff that Lori was talking about regarding relationship building. So if you have that connection or even are trying to build that connection, I certainly think that could go a long way towards doing that. So I definitely think it's a very good idea to keep those lines of communication open. And Henley, we have uh, Sammy Hampton has their hand raised. All right, go ahead, Sammy Hampton, if you want to speak, you can unmute yourself. Um, I apologize if someone um, did mention this earlier, but what I was wondering is I know during COVID, um, people were able to testify via video is and give oral testimony that way is that still an option or do you have to travel to annapolis to be able to give oral testimony i think we were going back and forth about this on the committee were we able to figure out an answer to this question it's a very good question what i what i know is and i'll, I'll have to check sammy and then i can let you know um what I know is that they were going to stop all video testimony this session. And so we were, many of the SILs um, probably signed on to a letter that went from Disability Rights Maryland, you know, our protection and advocacy agency, to the General Assembly, the powers that be, uh, that we did not want to lose this option because it was so incredibly helpful, not just to people with disabilities or someone who doesn't drive or that for whom getting to Annapolis is hard, but for anybody where it's a very long distance to get to Annapolis, it's just not always possible. So we stated all the reasons in that letter and asked for them to consider it. I have not heard from Disability Rights Maryland if there was a response to that. Oh, here, maybe Lauren knows, but um, but but we we can get back to you. The last I knew there was it was not going to be an option, but Lauren Young, our resident uh, connection here says, I think they're going to permit a hybrid model, but limited numbers to testify. So it's, yeah, so okay. we'll try to get more info. And I'm guessing it's still kind of unfolding, you know, as we as we launch into things here. We'll keep our, keep our uh, ears out for that. All right, thank you very much. It looks like Lori Elenoff has her hand raised also. All right, Lori, go ahead. I just wanted to say regarding the comment on testimony, it's also a good idea 
to thank people if they are sponsoring a bill, if they are saying that they that they vote that they're voting the way you want, to give a call or an email and thank them and show your appreciation. That's a good idea too. Yes, good relationship building there. I agree. Dave, I know you mentioned you saw a couple things in the chat. In the chat, was that all technical stuff, or were there any questions in there? There are I, a couple questions. One had already been answered. Um, <laughs> Julie asked, uh, "What if un this is a great question too? Because this comes up. What if unpaid volunteers want to lobby on behalf of cells? Is that considered an issue for the five hundred one c three?" My understanding, and Sarah and Dave can correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that that is not a problem. Volunteers can do whatever they like. Correct. You got it. It's all about the money, baby. <laughs> That's right. And then one more. Uh, what are important committees to advocate or lobby to for the funding need uh, um, other than appro beyond appropriations? What would other committees be? So... I'm less familiar with some of the committees, but I think um, Sarah is probably. Yeah, and on the Senate side, it's the budget committee. That's what their the finance one is called. But what what we would have what we have to wait and see is where and how our funding request might get placed in the budget, because then it becomes about um, if it's placed, you know. If we get it into the governor's budget and it's placed under doors, you know, then you would want to be participating in budget hearings around the doors budget because then it becomes very specifically located there. If it's in a supplemental budget, which would be more likely, it gets a little messier and we'll have to sort of address that when it happens. Um, but all the legislators vote on the budget. So so remember that it, it doesn't it doesn't hurt to talk to anyone about it. Um, but I think we'll have to narrow that down once we know more specifically where we might fall. I don't have any more questions in the chat. Could I, could I say one more thing? Please do. Um, I was just going to say, for those of you that are beginning on this advocacy journey, it's very, it's natural to feel a little bit nervous when you're making, when you're making contact with a legislator of your office. That, that's natural. But, but just remember, they want to vote and they're, they're serving you and they're serving our people. And so they, they, really, they, really, want, they really want to hear from you. And and so remember that they they really want they really want to hear what we have to say and you know make it make it personal make it a story and they they really they really they really want to hear so and it's their job and if if they do things that we like then we vote for them and they get to keep their job <laughs> so um, you know it really it is important and it is it is their job to address or at least listen to the concerns of the people who vote who voted them into office so um and they they hear from the public all the time this is nothing new to them so you know and once you do it a couple of times you'll get very used to it and it, it will become a lot easier yeah anything else in the chat from i know dave said he doesn't have any more danielle or sarah anything in your chat i don't have anything in my chat um but I think we have Kiana Mayo has raised her hand. All right, Kiana, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Hello. Um, well, I didn't have a question. I just really enjoyed this. And I just wanted to thank you guys for putting this together because it's very informative. Thanks, Kiana. Thank you, Kiana. I don't have any more questions. So I okay. think we're- This, this is Siobhan, I apologize. This is Siobhan at the last second. The only question I have is when they were going over how do you find your legislative people, um, is that website accessible for those who use screen readers? Because I know they were very nicely going over the map um, but that's all I wanted to know. 
Has anyone who used the screen reader gone over that site and used it? My hunch um, is that the map is not accessible, but uh, obviously, but I think the website itself is. Okay, so in regards to finding your legislative uh, person, yeah, I'm fairly certain it's there's you can just type in your address and yeah, there will be a map there that you can't see, but um, there should be listings there. Um, and Shafan, I can get back in touch with you and address that. I'll test that with my screen reader and uh, we'll connect with that and I'll just 100% make sure. Um, but I, I believe I've done it in the past and it's been fine, but I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Any other final questions before I pass things over to Sarah? All right, well, as you all are going through the documents that we sent out this morning, you'll notice that there was the toolkit and there's also the public policy platform, which outlines a lot of the concerns that the IL community has for this upcoming legislative session. I encourage you to take a look at both of those documents as you look at those documents and as you reflect upon this presentation, there may be more questions that come up. Uh, so I'll pass things over to Sarah. Um, and before I before I kind of let things go here, I want to thank you all again for your patience today. We had a couple of technological bumps in the road, but we made it through and we were able to get through all the content we wanted to share with everybody. So thank you for your patience and for your enthusiasm. And I'll hand it over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Before I do just a closing thing and then switch to Rose, um, Lauren did add into the chat to me that 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 Shafan, that that page should be accessible to there's been a lot of advocacy around it the last several uh, from several groups year before last so hopefully that has been uh, made fully accessible I know I know Mike Bullis and have, we've had some work that had to be done on that my MGA as well, where you can track bills and sign up to testify and um, he may be able to answer whether that's been fully rectified, but we'll see. Um, okay, I am going to, so I'm putting my email in the chat. It's sbasehart at innow.org. If you think of questions in the next few days or the next 90 days, the entire legislative session, you're welcome to send those to the community, to me and I can take them to committee at any time. Um, we're happy to continue answering questions and being supportive as the independent living legislative committee. Um, we also want to make sure that you know that um, we, if you're interested in joining, if you are a SIL staff or SIL, and I guess we're even going broader than that, anybody on this call, if you're interested in joining our legislative committee, we meet every Friday at 930 and anyone is welcome to join us. So if you would like to receive the, uh, we use the same Zoom link every week. So I'm happy to send it to you and you can save it and join us when you can. We also have um, a sort of an email listserv, you know, that we use to communicate with each other. Uh, this week, since the session will have launched, you know, we'll be starting to put bills into a bill tracker that we keep our eyes on through the legislative session and make sure that um, we know what our community might be interested in uh, watching or testifying on. So you're welcome to join us. We also encourage you, we can't see every bill that, go, you know, there are thousands of bills that go in every legislative session and we can't possibly find them all that relate to the disability community and our public policy platform. So you are encouraged as well to send us any bills that you hear about, maybe through other organizations that you volunteer with or work with. We are happy to um, take those and add them into our bill tracker so that we know um, that they're out there and to see what's uh, to see what's up with them and maybe get some folks to Annapolis. So you're you're welcome to send me a note if you'd like to be added to that list. Um, now I want to turn things over. I just want to make sure that Rose is here. Yep. Okay. So Rose Carey, who's the chair of the Maryland Silk, we're gonna give her the microphone. Rose, you'll just have to unmute and close us out. Thank you all.
Rose, Where's I she? believe it's star six to unmute. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I'm I'm in the category with Dave as far as technology technology is concerned, I think. Um, I'm Rose Terry. Uh, I'm a white female uh, and I am chair of the state and of the Maryland State Independent Living Council. And I just want to thank this committee for this amazing presentation uh, and, the, and the and the great information that was provided. Um, They've worked very hard in, in developing this presentation for the IL network, and it'll definitely be another valuable resource for um, the people of Maryland. And uh, I was having, I sent out an email earlier about NICL uh, conference, and um, NICL is going to be in July, of course, it's in Washington. And Lori had the uh, idea of maybe we could present this at NICL. Um, that would be absolutely fabulous, I think, if if you all agree, um, if you want to do that. Um, but I think it would be be so so helpful to to everyone. Um, and I appreciate all the hard work that everyone's done. Thank you. And I wish I could have been there. Thank you so much, Rose, and to everyone for being here with us today. I think that's all we have, but feel free to get in touch with us at any time. And uh, thank you again. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you all and Happy New Year. Thank you. Are you all good for the recording, Dave? Um, I should be. I'm going to stop it. Okay.